are you willing to encourage the mob? Because everything we know about history tells us that once you do that, you may not escape the mob. To get Brexit. Make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray is a conservative author, commentator, and writer. We're going to be talking about the tragic death of George Floyd, the protests and riots going on in America, and whether our society is institutionally racist. Every single week, we interview politicians, experts, and commentators for the series called Burning Questions. We've interviewed Douglas before, so check them all out in the link below. And I apologise in advance if you hear any noises. Unfortunately, there's some building work going on outside. Okay, Douglas Murray, thank you very much for joining us again. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Stephen. What's your take on George Floyd's death? Well, that's uh, there's a lot to say. Um, uh, the first thing is that this is something which, sadly, we've seen before in America, both the uh the killing itself and the response to it uh it's happened uh, for many years there have been cases like this uh in america rogue policemen uh you know killing uh, unarmed uh black men uh and the resulting breakdown of law and order that comes from legitimate protests turning into violent protests, peaceful protests, turning into violent protests, uh, justifiable um, anger turning into a uh, perpetuation of violence against innocent people of all colors. Um, and it's an incredibly sad thing to see uh, in a country I love and have enormous admiration and time for. Um, I mean, there's a lot to say because it's it's such a, a tricky moment because it's necessary to check exactly what happens uh, at the root of a, an issue before agreeing to what you should extrapolate out from it. And uh, we know from previous events, uh, things like the Ferguson shooting in uh, 2014, um, we know how important it is to find out exactly what has happened. And that is the, that's the realm of the law to find that out. Um, I'm not willing to concede every part of a story until I know every part of a story that I can. And I think there's something else worth saying here, which is that there are there are racial problems in America which are historical, uh, they're serious, and they uh, do need to be addressed. That is a separate thing from people saying, burn this down, or we built it so we can destroy it, or deciding to smash up businesses owned by law-abiding people who are black or white or setting upon people in the street who are black or white, uh, destroying people's homes, their livelihoods. And I have to say that what often happens at a moment like this is that people say, well, you're um, eliding the peaceful protesters and the small minority of violent protesters. I don't think that you have to do much work to do that at the moment because so many people, including extremely privileged, if you want to play that game, and uh, fortunate and wealthy and able to barricade themselves people in America are egging this on as we speak, celebrities agreeing to bail out anybody arrested whilst being caught looting, uh, um, prominent people in Hollywood and in politics who are saying the most crazy things about what people should do. Now, you see, it's, it's, it's my view that when a, when a rogue cop, and maybe we'll come back to that, but when a rogue cop, and I see no evidence, by the way, that, you know, this, this policeman who killed uh, Mr. Floyd uh, is, is, is sort of ordered to do so or anything, but he, the policeman in question is 
currently arrested and is in prison and will be tried. Um, I'm not willing to concede that the man who did that to Mr. Floyd in some way represents the Minneapolis police, let alone all of the American police, let alone police worldwide or police in all other democracies. We had a demonstration in London on sun Sunday of people uh, who said they were in solidarity uh, um, with uh, Black Lives Matter and other movements and who stopped at Downing Street to shout <laughs> the police at the policemen and women just guarding Downing Street. So I know I'm not willing to see the overspill of the critique to all policemen and women. And I'm certainly not willing to see that overspill that has already happened with abandon to, for instance, all white people. Uh, and I don't like the tone of voice in which this is being urged either. I don't like the tone of voice of people saying all white people dot, 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 any more than I would like it if people said all black people have to accept dot, dot, dot or have to confess, et cetera. I mean, so this, you, you asked a, a short question and this is perhaps a long answer, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's a big problem this because we're standing, America is standing on the precipice of the break, total breakdown of law and order. And the, the, the further immiseration of the world's most significant, richest and most powerful country. So this is no small juncture. Um, but I think it's incredibly to un important to understand what the realm of culpability is at a moment like this, both among the people who were responsible for this starting, that is the individual policemen, and the people who decide to extrapolate out from that. And I just want to say that, you know, just uh, this morning I watched uh, the comedian James Corden, who, you know, he may only be a comedian and late night chat show host, but in American society, as we know, television counts for an awful lot. It can, it can get you to the White House if you use it well enough. Uh, and James Corden used his soliloquy last night to wax quite lyrical about uh, what he thought the problem was and what he thought the solutions were. And one of the things he said, which he's been much praised for, is that he said, uh, 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 we can't expect black people to dismantle a problem they didn't create. I think I'm quoting him accurately, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It was something like that. We can't expect black people to dismantle a problem that they didn't create. Now, here's the thing. Nobody alive created the problem, even if we agreed on what the problem is. Let's say that we agree that there has been a historical problem of racism in America, as, by the way, there has been in and is in every country in the world. It's not a uniquely American thing, but there is a specific uh, uh, historical context in America, which is unusual, which is still reverberating, unusual in certain ways and reverberating certainly. But nobody alive set up that problem. And the reason I wanted to mention this is because this comes to one of the most important and little thought about, but most necessary to contemplate moral issues of our time, which is, do we believe in historic culpability or not? Do we believe that the sins of the father, if we agree the father is sinful, should be, should be revenged upon the son? Now, it's been the, the understanding in our civilization for an awfully long time that we don't believe in that. Now, that isn't to say that individuals haven't perpetrated versions of the sins of the father and so on. But in a massive issue of responsibility and culpability, let alone racial group culpability, as we know from history, you have to be incredibly wary before asserting what racial group is responsible for what. And we have spent recent years being told that repeatedly in certain directions, only to see it with abandon, being urged upon white Americans. And I think this is incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous to say that people who have no connection to a his no, no, I, I mean, other than a, you know, genetic or bloodline ancestry connection to something, have today to be held accountable for something. 
I don't like it wherever that's attempted to be exercised. And I don't like it in this occasion either. To me, there seems to be two parallels, parallel narratives being um, given out by each side. One is that, you know, we are a deeply institutionally racist country and society, um, and our society is built on racism. And a lot of people in America say that because of obviously the slave trade over there. Uh, and in Britain, we had had a slave trade a long time ago. Uh, and, and they're sharing videos on the internet of uh, police being brutal towards protesters, of police obviously um, going in and, and being you know, George Floyd's terrible death, the, the video of that, and, and all these, all these um, videos coming out there uh, that these people are retweeting on Twitter and sharing, um, as I say, of the protesters um, being, being attacked by police. And then you've got the other side saying, well, actually, George Floyd's death was a disaster, a tragedy, a murder. Um, you know, we should arrest the police officer involved. And I don't think I've seen any mainstream commentators say that that's not the case, by the way. Um, but these people say, you know, actually, these protesters are going too far. They're rioting, they're looting, they share videos of people being attacked by the protesters uh, or people's uh, businesses being burned down. I suppose my question really goes down to the, the, the nub of the issue, which I think is whether we are an institutionally racist society, because as soon as you um, don't accept that, then these protests become illegitimate in a way. Um, well, so do you they're think illegitimate are... anyway. They're illegitimate anyway. I mean, what is the legitimate reason to go to a business that a husband and wife of any color have spent their lives building up and smash it up and take what you want and assault them? Like, I mean, you'd have to have a damn sure cause to think you had the right to do that. In fact, I, I, I think it's pretty hard to think of any scenario where the cause is so just you're allowed to do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as it were, is this cause just enough? This is a fascinating one. I've just written my column this week for The Spectator on this. Look at the, um, uh, uh, um, because there's, a, there's an interesting British angle to this. Um, uh, um, in Britain, we had uh, Black Lives Matter protests, a major one about four years ago. Um, I wrote about it at the time. I went to see it. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, there was another sort of mini uh, protest in Hyde Park uh, where um, a group of people were chanting Black Lives Matter um, chants, including hands up, don't shoot. And uh, that night, uh, a British police officer was stabbed. I think three or four other uh, police constables were um, uh, hospitalized. And a young man was chased in the middle of Hyde Park Corner by four men wielding a machete. So I mention that because there's, there is a risk of spillover on these occasions by people very willing to pretend that there is, um, as I say, no difference between America and Britain. And, you know, again, the same people who say don't generalize, who will just decide that, you know, wh why not uh, attack a police officer in London uh, for something that a, a police officer, a rogue police officer in Minneapolis has done? Um, uh, so I'm, I, 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 but, but I mention this because on Sunday, there was a massive protest in London, some thousands of people in Trafalgar Square who um, processed onto the American embassy. It was, mainly, it, was, it, was, it was mainly peaceful. There were some arrests. And as I say, there were these very ugly scenes of, of um, demonstrators uh, in, uh, assaulting, uh, insulting the police at Downing Street, who had done nothing at all to deserve that. And, um, but I mention this because, of course, we are, although people are forgetting about it now, um, still in the middle of a very unusual moment in our history, the corona virus and the resulting lockdown. And we have been through weeks, indeed months in Britain, as in other countries in the lockdown, of uh, people being told they, oh, you know, mustn't visit their parents, or um, they mustn't go for a sunbathe on their own in the middle of a park, uh, or famously, in one case, uh, oughtn't to go to their parents if they and their wife are both very ill and hope that their parents might be able to look after their four-year-old son. So we've been through weeks of people shaming for people for all of these things because it was, it was sort of agreed upon, it's debatable, but it was agreed upon that 
it was extremely important to stop the spread of the coronavirus and that nothing was more important. Well, then on Sunday, thousands of people congregate in Trafalgar Square and move all the way through the center of London. Then no social distancing and evidence there. And, you know, you just have news reporters like a Sky News reporter standing in front and among the crowd, people brushing past her and saying, well, you know, technically this protest is this uh, protest is illegal, but people feel very strongly about things in the United States. So, they, oh, OK, so everybody in the UK uh, has to lock down. We're not allowed to have gatherings in our houses. We're not allowed to meet friends. We're now allowed to have tea with up to six people in our gardens if we're fortunate enough to have one. Oh, but the exception is if a Minneapolis uh, police officer does something appalling and utterly reprehensible, and then you can come out in the thousands and so there's an exemption. And I think it is incredibly important to watch what you're embedding at moments like this. Because one thing that that says is, actually, there is definitely an overriding thing that is much more important than the health of the public. And that is protesting against uh, uh, um, a racist, uh, uh, a, a racist cock, co uh, cop in, uh, uh, in Minneapolis. And I, I, I just, th this, this fills me with alarm of what people are just brushing through at such moments. Uh, and that brings me to the, 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 the heart of your question. You see, I don't accept this language at all. I don't accept the characterization. I don't accept the characterization that there are, as it were, racist societies and non-racist societies. Societies in which racism exists and societies in which it doesn't. Uh, and the idea, the characterization of what I think of as being, and I mean, I always get a lot of flack for this, but here we go. What I think are the least racist societies in the world being portrayed as the most racist is egregious and unacceptable. It is, it is not fair to characterize Britain as an unbelievably racist society. And you just have to, to start from the premises on that. Where are you comparing us to? Who are you comparing us to? What's your, what's your um, measure for this? What's your measure here in Britain for that? And what's your measure internationally for that? Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, which is loving what is going on in American cities right now. The, the Chinese Communist Party interned in concentration camps one million Uyghurs in recent years. Is that racism? Is it systemic racism? If so, how does it compare to the alleged racism of Great Britain? How does it compare to the racism that is claimed in America? What is the league table of this? How are you measuring it? And so, because nobody's willing to do any of that, we have this obscene situation where people just assert things about American society, about British society. They, they talk all the time about the importance of context and they provide none themselves. So no, I don't accept that Britain is an institutionally racist society. I think that America has very particular historical issues, which, I mean, you know, <laughs> Among the ways to try to address them over time, probably the least likely or successful one is to weaponize racial groups against each other in the manner that certain demagogues are doing at the moment. But it's an extremely dangerous moment for this. And I suspect that a lot of people, as we've seen, corporations and uh, prominent public figures and others will decide to do the really what is at the moment the easy thing, which is to say things like, yes, I accept white guilt, or yes, I accept white supremacy exists, or, and et cetera, et cetera. And they'll beg for their lives. And they'll, they'll get down on their knees, literally in some cases. And you see absurd things like Ben and Jerry's ice cream converting their front page to, to Black Lives Matter slogans. You make ice cream, you dolts. We don't come to you for anything else, anything else. You see, 
um, corporation after corporation in America, basically begging people not to loot their stores by saying that they support Black Lives Matter and promise to hire more diversity offices, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be a lot of people in the coming days, as in the days we've just passed, who will be taking that route because they will think that it'll give them an easy life, but they are building up hell for their future and their collective future. Let me play devil's advocate very quickly. Um, Do. Uh, <laughs> this is what the, I'm sure this is the point that, that those who uh, disagree with you would put to you. Um, and there is a vast majority, I think, of people, especially on Twitter, who probably disagree with you. Um, they would say, Douglas Murray, you, sir, are a white man. Therefore, you could never uh, experience racism. You could never experience the kind of experiences that black people experience. So who are you? to have any kind of opinion, view, or understanding of what it's like to be a black man in America or Britain or anywhere else in the world? Well, the problem with this game is that it's an irreducible game. I wrote about this a bit in The Madness of Crowds, uh, in my last book, and uh, I have a chapter on race there, which uh, that raises this, this issue among others. The, the issue of alleged incomprehensibility across racial boundaries. Now, first of all, um, it is an impossible game that is being demanded when we start down this route. And it goes something like this. It's two things that are asserted simultaneously, which are totally contradictory. People who say simultaneously, you must understand me. A thing that's very often said in a tone of considerable menace, you must understand me. Simultaneously, you will never understand me. So let's, let's start from the, the very base of that presumption. Because of my skin color, and by the way, you can play this in, in other realms as well. You can do it on sexuality, you can do it on sex. Because I am a woman, or because I am heterosexual or homosexual, I am a, a, um, a man, or because I'm black, or because I'm white, or because I'm Asian, or whatever else you want to do, because of this thing, you can't understand me. I don't think that's the beginning of any dialogue. I think it's the end of any potential dialogue. Total end to it. You can't understand me. If that's the case, what's the point? What's the point? Perhaps that, is, you, perhaps that is their point to try and end the dialogue um, there. Uh, quite possibly. And then let me say what, what the obvious follow-up to that is. If we don't have speech, we only have violence. If we don't have vi uh, dialogue, we only have violence. The point of speech is that it is the thing you do, not just to avert violence, but instead of violence. Otherwise, people have no other way to make themselves heard. Now, I believe in dialogue, in speaking, and not in violence. But when somebody says, basically, any and all dialogue with you, and brackets, all of you, what we perceive to be your kind, close brackets, is totally useless. What does that leave open exactly? I feel very strongly about this because you could see this being done in every direction once that catches on. Because we have decided you, you of your group have no ability to understand our group, we'll do what exactly? Now, you know, There are a lot of people who have done a lot of good work, a lot of good thinking and a lot of good dialoguing throughout our lifetimes and before. History in America in particular, literary history in America, political history is rife with people who have spent their lives trying to ensure that dialogue not only continues but gets somewhere. And it is such an insult to them and to their memory when people who don't even know about them, haven't even read them, haven't even contended with their thoughts, can't even name them, decide that all of that is totally pointless and that because they themselves feel particularly angry at this moment, all of that was worthless. I mean, you know, Let's just revisit this again. The, the police in America 
if we wanted to solve that issue, and there are a lot of people, black cops, white cops, black politicians, white politicians, who have been, my God, it's not as if this isn't an area that the American policing has thought about. And, and you know, it's not like it's just a total wild west and everyone can do whatever they want and, and, and they're ordered to be racist or anything. I mean, I've traveled over most of the states in the United States for about probably a quarter of a century now. And I, it's a very big, complex, messy, and brilliant country. But my God, they have tried to address issues like uh, policing. And if you're going to try to solve that one, never mind before you get onto the whole presumptuous game of deciding which ethnic groups have total culpability across the globe for any m one person's actions, if you're, going to, if you're going to do that, at least contend with the fact that, um, that the American police have certain, certain challenges which are unusual, shall we say. I mean, it's true that um, American, uh, black Americans are disproportionately killed whilst in custody by police in the US, but it's also true that in simple new numerical terms, year on year, more white people are killed in custody by US police. Now, what are we to make of that? You know, is it worth at least, instead of making it some kind of ping pong talking point, isn't it something that's interesting and worth uh, uh, um, interrogating as an issue? How about, how about another one? You know, the American public are the most armed citizenry, I think, in the world, must be in the world. And because of this, the uh, um, Second Amendment, what, whatever you think about it, and obviously in Britain we have a different view on that, I think, from many Americans, but because of the Second Amendment, uh, the American police, when they pull over any car or enter any household, have much less certainty than, say, the British police do, that they aren't walking into an unbelievably heavily armed situation. Um, does that make their job harder? Yes, certainly. Certainly. Does it excuse outrageous and reprehensible things like what happened in Minnesota? No, obviously not. But is their job very hard? Yes. And if you want to help make that job uh, harder, then that's one direction you could go in. Or you could try to make it easier in some way. You could be one of the many, many people of every ethnic background in America who's worked incredibly hard on policing issues throughout our lifetimes and long before. Um, but this is, this is such a disturbing time because of the number of people who've decided that they don't want to bother with any of that. And the truth is there's lots of reasons why that might have happened. I think that one reason is obviously that people have been basically confined to their homes in recent months and every society has been rather rife, ripe for a sort of blowout of some kind. I'm sure you felt it. I think, I think most people have, have noticed something of that. And that's obviously one element. One element is, is absolutely legitimate uh, uh, um, grievance and a feeling that the system is stacked against them in some way still and, 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 and much more. And let's face it, a lot of people, and there are so many videos of this and you can't ignore them and you can't decide not to contend with them. A lot of people have just decided they would like to take stuff. And a lot of people just want to go and be violent to people. Look at the so-called Antifa activists, the so-called anti-fascists who have an enormous amount more in common with the second bit of their name than the first. Look at these so-called Antifa activists. They just go out onto the street and want to create chaos. They want to harm people. They want to hurt people. They want to beat people up, to hospitalize them. They enjoy violence. They get off on it. They're thrilled with it, the frisson of it. By the way, these Antifa activists, certainly if the arrest records are anything to go by, seem very predominantly to be white, and rather, if you want to play that game, again, privileged people. These are people who get off on the kick of violence. They've existed throughout human history. They always will exist. And the question for society is always the same. Do you 
decide that the people who get a kick from violence and will use any name to perpetrate it on this occasion, so-called anti-fascism. Do you decide that they can do it or not? That's an important decision to make because what you call that on that one, which way you decide to go on that one, decides whether you have civilization and law or not. I started the interview by asking about George Floyd's death. Uh, I don't think um, I would feel uh, good with myself if I didn't ask about another man's death. And his name is David Dorn. I'm not sure how, fo how close you followed his case. Uh, he served in his community as a police captain for 38 years in America. Um, and he was shot and killed yesterday during, during the looting and the, and the rioting. Um, he was responding to, to a neighbor, a friend uh, whose store was getting, getting robbed. He was actually retired. Um, why is his name not known around the world? Why is his name not on the media 24 seven? Uh, well, firstly, because it's so recent, um, maybe it will be. I suppose really one should hope that it will be in the days and weeks ahead. But at feverish times like this, people very often choose which facts that they want to accept and which they do not. There's an incredibly important, there are incredibly important precedents throughout history for this. Do you, do you decide you know what the answers to everything is? Do you decide, for instance, you have a totalistic answer to everything, such as patriarchy or white supremacy, or you can name any number of others? Do you decide you have the total explanation for everything and therefore you select the facts that will fit into that? Or do you recognize that the world is a bit messier than that? There is no one totalistic explanation for everything. And that things come up that will confound you and contradict you and you ought to absorb them too. I mean, I just wonder, all of those people, particularly perhaps the celebrities who I say gate themselves off from the rest of society and in some cases have been willing on the destruction of society beyond their compounds. I wonder whether those people will feel the shame they should feel at having whipped these things along at the beginning after seeing just unwatchable footage like that, that you've just described and and much more and and here's the thing there's always a type of person who says who pushes that sort of thing away i'm so convinced of the justness of my cause that i don't need to contend with that or stop it that's a right-wing talking point or oh you're just using that dead x to do y And you have to wonder where the, just the damn humanity is left in somebody who's willing to play a game like that. So I've often argued with people and debated with people who have something like that. I, I've ne it's not exactly a humble thing to say, but I, you just can't improve on what George Orwell said when he met a fanatic of a similar ilk. There's a, one of my favorite stories of him was him debating with a Stalinist in the 1940s. This is after the Ukraine famine, after the show trials, after 37, after 38. I mean, this is, this is when you already knew everything you needed to know about Comrade Stalin. And Orwell is debating with this Stalinist and he concedes this and he concedes, uh, he, he, well, yes. And, uh, and then there were the, you know, the trials, well, blah, blah, blah. And he goes on and on, just, just refusing really to deal with every single one of the things that's already come up and eventually says that great immortal uh, get out for cowards across the centuries. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. And George Orwell says to the Stalinist, Where's your omelet? This is the thing. There will be people who will be saying, after the atrocities that will be going on, because people have decided to toy with chaos and violence, there will be people who will say versions of that. Well, 
you can't break an om- you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs we can't deal with the uh, oppression of society without there being casualties and so on and so forth. And we have to say, where's this omelet of yours? What's this great creation that you have unleashed since the death of Mr. Floyd? What is this great thing that you've accomplished that makes the murder of black men or black women or assaults on black men, or assaults on black women, or the killing of white men, or the killing of white women, the killing of human beings. What is it you have accomplished in recent days that makes that worthwhile? Because it ought to be pretty damn good. It ought to be beautiful. It ought to be beautiful and last for all time to justify that. But they haven't got anything. They haven't got anything. They've just got this great mess, great American cities in double lockdown, in lockdown and curfew now. What's that achieved? I want to put a quote to you um, that I think goes to to what you're saying there um, about the the, the fantastic omelette uh, analogy. Uh, this is from CNN's Chris Cuomo. Now he's probably one of the most powerful men in america i mean like he's so he certainly the, thinks so yeah well in terms of his voice i mean he's 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 got a huge audience and his mm. the, he's the a great blowhard quite he's, he's great great american tv blowhards the, the tough sway, guy tough guy exactly the sway really he has just from the absolute epicenter behind the camera i mean just in front of the camera it's just yeah He's so this is the, this is him talking about the 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 protests and and some of the violent protests. He says, "Quote, please show me where it says protesters are supposed to be polite and peaceful." Can you respond mm. to that? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I have a little interest in Chris Cuomo. Firstly, because I think he and his brother are among the most reprehensible figures in American public life. I mean, if you haven't seen the clip of him and his brother arguing on TV about who their mum loves most, you haven't wretched recently. Um, uh, and also because of his uh, ridiculous self-aggrandizing re- self-removal from his own lower ground floor, coming out of Corona isolation. I mean, these these creations on American media is just anyhow. Um, uh, well, it was interesting, wasn't it, the way that he and the network he ro- works for, CNN, uh, uh, egged this on in the early days, and the way in which. Having egged it on, of course, the mob then came to their office, their headquarters in Atlanta. Now, the mob that tried to, well, that that graffitied the CNN logo at the front of the Atlanta headquarters, that smashed the glass front of the building of CNN headquarters in Atlanta, that that, that threw projectiles in, firecrackers and some other things, that meant that the police had to form a cordon in the front lobby of the CNN building, and a CNN reporter had to report live, and I have to say rather terrified, from the lobby of his own employers. That all happened on Friday night? Yeah, Friday night. The days are going kind of slowly at the moment. Um, That all happened on Friday night. Now, the people who laid siege, there's no other way of saying that, to the CNN headquarters were not Trump supporters. They were not white supremacists. They were not institutional racists. They appeared to be a somewhat diverse crowd. Um, And CNN has expressed no particular interest, it seemed to me, in um, identifying uh, uh, the people who laid siege to its headquarters. Again, if they'd been Trump supporters, I would have expected there to have been some notice of this on CNN. I would think they would do the odd segment about it, maybe even a journalistic investigation. Remember the days when those occurred on television. And um, and instead, uh, they, they sort of, uh, you know, accepted it as maybe as part of their down payment. And in the days since, CNN correspondents have gone on to describe the people who've been looting and pillaging in American cities as people who have a sense of grievance 
or as one correspondent said the other day on CNN, feel they don't have a voice. I mean, uh, you get almost into the realm of sexual kinks on some of this stuff. You know, what do you have to have in your psyche for you to be attacked and then to find justifications not just for your attacker, but to try to cover over what your attacker did. I mean, we're into, the, we're into the realm of psychiatry somewhere here, at the very least, if not sexology. And I'm afraid this all goes to the root again of one of the problems of our time, which is this unwillingness to contend with facts as they emerge, and instead to have your own prearranged set of views, and you just pick along and take the bits that you find uh, um, justify that. The attack on the CNN headquarters on Friday night did not fit into the CNN narrative, so they just ignored it. They just, they just let it pass by. That's why, uh, uh, that's why we have this bifurcation in news in America. That's why we have the breakdown of information. It's why our, our information providing networks are all faulty at the moment because of things like that. Last night, um, I was scrolling on my, I don't know if you have Instagram, but it's, it, there was this thing, I think it was called Blackout Tuesday and people were posting black squares in solidarity. They were posting all these things about how Black Lives Matter everywhere all over their personal um, feeds. I think my friend said he thought that Instagram had crashed, but it was just, I just um, was kind of taken aback by just how many people, how many people who, uh, my friends and peers who are putting this, this stuff out there. Do you think that, well, there's sort of two explanations as to why they did it. I mean, the first one is that they legitimately feel that there is an injustice and they must, um, they must share to, their whole, to their, everyone in their lives how angry they are and how much in solidarity they are with the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Or the other uh, explanation, and I think Jordan Peterson said this very well in, the, in a Joe Rogan podcast I was listening, he, he listening to. He said, um, the easiest thing in the world is to hold up a protest sign or share something on Facebook because it's the, it's the quickest hit you can get to virtue. And it's the quickest thing you can do and the easiest thing you can do to, um, to feel good about yourself. So do you think, what, which one of those explanations do you find more legitimate? Um, well, I think they're, they're both legitimate and I think there's a lot more potential reasons for that. I'm not on Instagram. I, I do very little social media. I, I don't think social media is healthy for a society much, and it's definitely clearly not healthy for individuals. The ones I know who've done it too much almost all become gibbering wrecks and uh, rather sad cases, don't really live their lives very happily and uh, are just not better or wiser for it. That said, uh, um, various social media platforms are quite useful for getting certain um, factoids swiftly. Uh, and so I do a bit. I do a bit of scrolling to find that sort of thing, and then I do something more meaningful with my day. Um, but yes, um, I I know about the Instagram uh, Blackout Day. It's a sort of um, a rather pathetic, meaningless gesture-ridden thing, which um, our societies hooked on social media encourage. Um, what else are you going to do? You know, I mean, if you if you do feel uh, uh, very strongly about this, and I, I, I accept that some people do, uh, I don't think strongly enough to have some of the responses that have occurred, but uh, obviously a lot of people do feel very strongly about it. Well, you know, it's the uh, easiest way to demonstrate that without any uh, consequence, and uh, that's obviously part of it. I do think that a significant part of it is people who are basically terrorised into not it, it terrorized into the fear of what would happen if they didn't do it. Um, uh, friends on that platform uh, tell me that this was quite commonplace yesterday as this was going on, that they just knew that there were people who just didn't particularly want to make any statements about racial politics in America, but thought that if they didn't, then, then people would think they were a racist. And by the way, I mean, that's a very common tactic across uh, um, societies in general. I mean, generally speaking people fear of being singled out from the herd and i mean we know we, we you know human beings are a, a variety of animal and we uh 
we have common behavior patterns with the animal kingdom and among them are our fear of being left out from the herd. What will happen if we are identified as, as being alone in the world? What happens if the herd kicks us out? How do we survive? Now, happily, one of the glories of the human species is the willingness of a certain portion, a minority admittedly, but a certain portion, to not mind whether they exist apart from the herd and to find their own way of living without the blessing, the need, or the cover of the herd. It's one of the great things throughout human history, is people who didn't need that cover. And those are the people who do great things in their lives. Those are the people who've made a difference. That isn't to say that the herd doesn't have a virtue to it, can't have a virtue to it. it doesn't mean that there isn't a virtue on occasion to demonstrating you are a part of it. It's not, not a straightforward in or out group thing. But it can be very risky for people. And what people do, and I've seen this all my life, uh, in public and in private, what most people do is whatever is needed to have a quiet life. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, is that there have been times in the past when to have a quiet life meant having totally the opposite presumptions or very different presumptions to the ones that the herd online in particular now advocates. But at the moment, there is a particular set of things you are meant to demonstrate, meant to say. Uh, you, I assume if you had used Instagram yesterday and said, look, I happen to be white, but uh, I don't feel any culpability for one cop in Minnesota's actions, so jog on. I would have thought that would have brought quite a world of online virtual pain. If you worked in a corporation or a, a large company of some kind that was vulnerable to mob stampedes against it, you might have found that you could have lost your job by the end of the day. There'd have been enough complaints to the HR department. The HR department would have kicked it upstairs. They would have said, look, we just don't want any of this fuss. Get rid of them. So the stakes are quite high, actually, for, 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 for most people. Um, and they weigh up the downside that could come against the quite simple, relatively painless thing of just, uh, you know, doing what you're told to do today. And my own view, very quickly, my own view on, on, is, is that you shouldn't do that, by the way. I mean, I think that people shouldn't, by and large, be um, uh, bullied into saying things, demonstrating things, prostrating themselves. Uh, I don't think it's a healthy instinct. I think it's a, a very unhealthy instinct, firstly, because you make yourself weak and pathetic and you, you, you make yourself available for whatever the next thing is you're asked to do. Dance to this tune next week and you'll do it. So it makes you a much more weak and pathetic person than you were just a day before. And the second thing is, of course, and the much more important thing on a societal level, is that there's a possibility that you'll just be waving through lies and half-truths and presumptions that you shouldn't be waving through. On this occasion, for instance, the presumption that America, in its huge and complex, what, 360 million strong capacity, is just one thing. You might want to just do that because you don't see much uh, uh, harm from it. You know, you, there will be harm from that. There always is. I mean, if, if, you, if you were a person in Britain doing that yesterday, for instance, you'll find that after, after agreeing that America is that, you'll be asked to agree that Britain is that. And can you do that? Oh, okay, you can do that as well. Well, there'll be follow on demands from that as well. How well do you dance? Let's watch some dance. Um, I suspect what people would say who disagree with you in terms of the narratives of history is this. Um, particularly if they are I mean, a minority or a black person, for example, they would say, I have experienced racism all of my life. Um, and you could point to tons and tons of racism throughout anyone's life as a minority. And I'm sure that there, are, there, is, there is so much of this out there it, all over the world. And specifically because we're in, in the Western world, let's, let's talk about the Western world. So they would say, look, this has come from somewhere. And 
that that somewhere is our history. We've seen all of these. Um, we've we've basically seen in the Western white world, Britain go out there and pillage and plunder um, uh, uh, vast colonies. We've seen the slave trade. We've seen um, black people and, and and minorities not getting civil rights uh, until you know very recently, the twentieth century. So perhaps their argument would be this: all of these uh, events in history. Uh, that you could say uh, you could say these events in history are now relevant today because those people experience all of those ter terrible racist experiences, and the only way to stop those racist experiences happening would be to understand our past and to understand those specifically bad things that Britain did, for example. Yeah, but I, I, I know of very few people who um, think that, for instance, empire was an unalloyed good. Um, and I think anyone who who did think that it was just good for everyone would be rather foolish, in fact, very foolish. Um, I also think that anyone who thinks that the history of the empire, of the British Empire, was simply one of looting and pillaging, and something which causes a need for historical, um, uh, you know, retribution uh, centuries later, is. Um, uh, is also very foolish and uh, naive and simplistic and much more. Um, and I'm, I mean, there are several ways to approach this question. And one is, again, to point to the very important question of who are you comparing us with? Um, our story in Britain used to be um, our, our pride in the abolition of the slave trade. Uh, that Britain at considerable cost uh, to itself, uh, abolished the slave trade. Uh, now, in my own lifetime, in our own lifetime, this has been changed as a narrative, and we've gone to the narrative of uh, slavery. We've gone back to the, the pre the, the virtue bit, to the vice. Uh, and again, like I'm very, I'm very keen to have people studying the slave trade and the history of empire and much more. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. I think there's an enormous amount more that can be known and, and said, and let alone widely known. Um, like, who, who would want to stop that? But I think it's exceptionally unhealthy to have people thinking that their job or their task, let alone their, their source of meaning in life, is to, is to go at that look at it in an incredibly simplistic light, and then use it against the country at the moment. I think it's unfair. I, there's an example I've, I've often given over the years on this. I first gave in Athens some years ago, it was a rather popular point in front of an Athenian audience, uh, that uh, you could do this game with the uh, Ottoman Empire, which is, was one of the most important and uh, um, significant widespread uh, um, empires in history. And you could do this against modern day Turkey. Um, again, I mean, there were some people in Greece who wouldn't mind doing that. And, and that's not very ancient history for many Greeks. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the millions, uh, there was over a million people who had to flee from Asia Minor uh, in, the, in the era of the end of the Ottoman Empire and the collapse of it and the, and the, the, the attacks on, 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 on people. And, and this is a very, very messy episode, and not, not even to mention the Armenian genocide, not even to get into that. And, you know, we, we could do that. I just, and I, I want historians to look at it. I, I, I'm thrilled by anyone who, who, who wants to look at that area of history, as any area of history. But it would be very strange, and I would question somebody's motives, if they just wanted to do that to demonstrate how vile modern Turkey is, or something. It's just, that's not a reasonable way to look at the, the Turkish people now. I mean, it's definitely useful in all sorts of things for understanding uh, current government and, 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 and so on, but what's, what's, what's your aim here exactly? Isn't, a, isn't an unreasonable question to ask when somebody is talking about a history and has selected a version of history that is so extraordinarily um, biased in one direction. I mean, we, we're used to the allegation of bias of trying to um, 
cover your own tracks, as it were, as a society, a sort of um, PR version of history. But, but there is this other version, which is the opposite of that. <clears throat> history used solely for the purposes of denigration of a country. You know, again, nobody, you mention points like this, and people say, oh, that's just a talking point. But it doesn't seem a small thing. If you're really interested in slavery, I would think that at least part of your time would be spent looking at slavery as it exists today in certain countries in Africa, apart from anything else. Um, uh, 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 like, okay, you specifically care about slavery a lot two centuries after Britain uh, abolished it. Um, but if you, if you care about the historical slavery so much, surely you would spend a, a portion of your time on the ongoing current slavery. I mean, I know people who do. Uh, um, I mean, I know people who've, who've campaigned a lot on this issue, people like Caroline Cox, who's in the House of Lords, who, who's, who's spent a lot of her life on the issue of ongoing modern day slavery and travels all around Africa all the time. Um, I, I, I just, I don't see it very much. And the activists who want to talk about it just don't seem much interested in it. And I don't say that means they're all bad, but I, 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 it allows me to at least be slightly suspicious of their motives and their tone of voice in talking about British history. So no, it comes down to the fact that I think that it is not, I'm not up for a totally unfair, unreasonable, unjust, one-sided, interrogative and hostile analysis of any country's culture. And I'm not willing to have it on my own. That's for sure. Finally, I want to ask you um, a, a really broad question about our society as a whole. It seems to me these riots have torn a plaster or sort of ripped open um, a, a, a sort of bubbling anger um, from all sides and, and various different groups uh, and people around the world. I mean, it certainly made me angry in various ways. I mean, this is something that's happening 4,000 miles away and it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's exposed emotions like uh, no other event that I've seen in, at least in, in my lifetime for, for a very long time. Um, what do you think is happening to, uh, to our society? Where does this end? Well, I think that you're right. That's a very broad question. Um, uh, I don't know. As I said earlier, we never know anything when we're going through it. Uh, all we can do is have our best headlights on and try to see a little bit ahead. I suppose there's two things primarily that I can see. The first is, important, is, is the importance of this by no means small question in America of the law. Private property. If it's agreed... <clears throat> that the burning down of private property is permissible, then everything is permissible. If it is agreed that people can go into shops and take things, then they can go and take anything, anytime they want, down the road from this. That's not, that's not, a, small, that's not a small thing, that's, that's not a small step. That's, that's one of the most important steps that a society can, can take, whether you agree that the law holds or not. Now, uh, that we have, by the way, some very, very moving uh, um, scenes from recent days. I say that with slight irony. You'll realize what I'm about to say. We have, for instance, an NBA writer uh, who on Friday of last week, sorry, Thursday of last week, uh, tweeted out a picture of a burning building in Minnesota and said, burn it down, burn it. A day later, Friday, he was on Twitter, this same person, um, was tweeting his um, disagreement with, as it happens, the black female mayor of Atlanta, who had, who had urged protesters, rightly, the only reasonable and responsible thing to do at this point, urged protesters to be peaceful and to vent their feelings peacefully. And this person, this NBA writer, said on Twitter, no, 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 she's wrong. The only language people understand is burning things down. Uh, peacefulness hasn't got us anywhere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On Saturday night, the same person could be found on Twitter saying that the community just up the road from them had just been attacked. People were climbing over the gates. And then 
They're outside my building. They've pillaged the Starbucks. They're burning. They're attacking my building. Get away, you animals, he said. Go back to your own neighborhoods. So this is the line, isn't it? This is the line. Are you willing to encourage the mob? Because everything we know about history tells us that once you do that, you may not escape the mob. I mentioned the French Revolution earlier. It's a very pertinent example, which anyone interested in our own time might care to study. Um, you encourage the burning of some buildings, and before you know it, it's perfectly possible the mob might, might be outside your building. Well, what are you going to do then? So this isn't a small thing. And that's, that's the first thing to say. The important thing for America is whether, whether people, doesn't matter about skin color, it doesn't matter about skin color, it matters but with their citizens, whether citizens are up for grabs and their property is up for grabs or not, whether the law holds or not, that's not a small thing, it's not a talking point. The second thing is um, that it's worth having our headlights on is just the one you, we just touched on. It's whether or not, whether we can hold, hold accountable the people who actually want racial division, whether those are the, I think, relatively small number, but uh, ugly, very unpleasant people who are actually white supremacists in America and elsewhere. Um, they do exist. They exist in America. They exist to some extent in other places as well. Um, there are people like that who've always wanted a race war. Um, and those people must be given no quarter, must be not allowed to get anywhere in the furtherance of their arguments and their cause. Likewise, the people who are black or think that they are doing things to support black people who have decided that in order to eradicate racism, they will become racist. Those people must not be allowed to win. The people who, of all colors, who are actually in favor of people of different skin colors getting along. I mean, it's just so obscene and absurd for somebody of my generation who grew up without this being an issue, you know? To even be thinking that this is coming at us in these terms. But those of us of any skin color who actually want racial harmony <sighs> just have to make sure that we keep out the racists from all sides. And as I see it, the white supremacist racists don't have much chance of winning people to their cause at the moment. The People who are racists thinking that they are helping black people in the process do have people coming to their cause. And I think they will be the biggest recruiting sergeants for the racists on the other side of that spectrum. So I don't, so I don't think it's a small thing that's happening of, of, I don't think it's just, you know, why not post something on Instagram? Why not release a sort of Twitter message? Why not say, you know, what does it matter? There are lives versus property. What does it matter? I'm just going to agree to the latest Black Lives Matter thing. I, I'm just going to say that an entire race of people who I don't like thinking of as a race, you know, I just hate this idea that they're, they're putting on us that they're like white people. I, I, I don't think of myself as, you know, I mean, just, I don't think of society in these terms. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, if people are going to decide that an entire race of people are um, are to be are to be treated like this, uh, I don't think it's going to be a healthy future for anyone. I'm deeply, deeply. I can't stress how concerned I am by this, um, because we get these we get these little glimpses. History is filled with them, and not just the histories of revolutions, but the histories of societies in, in pre-revolutionary eras. Um, we get glimpses of the fact that what always happens is that people for a moment get caught up and get high on things which afterwards they regret. And it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite terrifying to be living through a time when that's going on and you can already see in historical terms how it might be described. 
that that we are that we that we, we risk seeing an unraveling particularly of american society and we've seen that possibility an awful lot and it's going on at the moment and there are some people i may be finished with this thought there are some people who want it and there are some people who want it because they think that what comes after is nirvana and there are some people who want it because they are genuinely so angry with something that has happened and there are some people and we know this every every era there are some people who in the famous words the joker in batman just want to see the world burn and there are i'm sorry to say it people who just like this they are thrilled they can't believe their luck that they because it feels like it's meaningful it feels like they're involved in something it feels like they're part of something it feels like they can do something do anything and that's thrilling for a time right up until the time that the fire is outside your house so we are dealing with playing with some people are playing with incredibly dangerous matches i just think that everybody of whatever it doesn't matter a damn to me what people's skin color is but people of every background end up having to unite against the people whatever their background who would try to make that fire burn us all up and on that thank you very much douglas murray for joining us now i would say to people watching this if you want to see a more optimistic take on the world um, then you can go and watch our last interview where we we have a whole segment about why douglas is optimistic about the world so um go and watch that if you haven't <laughs> already uh, so thank you very much douglas for joining us next time i join you stephen that'll be it we'll do yes. optimism next time because there'll hopefully next time be an enormous amount to be optimistic about absolutely absolutely thank you okay it's been a pleasure <laughs>